If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 23. Acts 23. Today I'd like to speak to you about Paul on trial. And again, it wasn't a formal trial, but there was the Sanhedrin there. Uh, there was a lot of people. Uh, they weren't in the courtroom per se. They were probably in a common area. Uh, but the commander realized that there was a problem and uh, he was giving Paul a chance to speak. Let me give you the rest of the outline. Paul on trial. Number one, the confrontation. The confrontation. Folks, you will run into confrontations. Ones that you were invited to and ones you had no clue that was going to happen. All right? Sometimes we're just blindsided. We just happen to walk in the room and somebody just goes off on us. All right? It happens. Number two, the conflict. There is always going to be conflict in this world. And here it is, folks. It's good and it's evil. That's the conflict. It's always going to be clashing. All right? Evil does not like good and good does not like evil. So we need to understand there's going to be conflict. There's going to be confrontation. And number three, the conquest. I got news for you, folks. God wins. God wins. And listen to me, this is so important. You may win an argument, but you could lose a Christian friend. Okay, maybe you won. Maybe you got the last word in. But folks, we have to understand, our whole goal in life is not to win, it's to be like Jesus. It's to be like Jesus. And so in this, I don't see any scripture any more important than this as far as the ultimate challenge to be like Jesus. Because our natural instinct, our flesh, wants to react. We want to say something. And we have always said, when words get out there, folks, uh, you cannot take them back. You know, Paul's life had come a complete circle. He once uh, was one of the most feared men because of his persecution of the church. Saul's encounter with God on the road to Damascus totally changed his life. He now was the most persecuted Christian of his day. Every, uh, everywhere he went, Jewish opposition rose against him. And this new uh, religious sect called the Way, and they are Christians. By the way, it's fine to be called a Christian, but I prefer to be called a follower of Christ. Okay, I, I like Christian, but we are followers of Jesus Christ. The discovery that Paul was a Roman citizen was probably the only thing that saved, him, saved his life when a riot broke out in the temple courts. All Paul wanted was his day in court to tell the Sanhedrin his side of the story. Most men would not have the courage to face these powerful religious men. And folks, there were 70 of them, okay? The odds were 70 to 1. But <laughs> my Bible said, with God, nothing is impossible. It doesn't matter what the odds are. But Paul had no fear because he knew God was with him, and nothing would stop him in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And folks, that was the bottom line of Paul's whole life. Everywhere he went, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Let's look at Paul on trial today. Acts 23, verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council. Earnestly means you look them in the eye. Okay? Earnestly means face to face. He was not scared. He was not backing down. All right? And said, men and brethren. You have to realize, folks, more than 20 years ago, he probably knew some of these folks, and some of these had grown, grown older. And though he hadn't seen many of them in 20 years, uh, even at that, when you go home, uh, when you go back to reunions and you go back to things, even uh, f family reunions and things like that, you see people that you haven't seen in years. So Paul probably didn't know half of them at this point, but there were several that he recognized. Men and brethren, which is a respectful term, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And folks, when you get saved, God erases your sins as far as the east is from the west. What I did before I got saved is forgiven. It's under the blood of Christ. 
And see, Satan wants to bring those back. Folks, you don't even have to answer him on that one. It's already done. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. And the deal about I have lived a good conscience, Paul, excuse me, I'm telling you, he wasn't perfect. There were some decisions that I look at and I'm thinking, uh, you probably, uh, the one with John Mark, not wanting to take John Mark and Barnabas, who was a son of encourager, all right? I know God's plan was done out of that, but Paul was just ba basically saying, hey, he, he cut out on me and I'm, he's not going to do it for a second time. And here's why I say this. Isn't our God a God of second chances? Third chances. See, he come to me three times. First time, I was just ignorant. I didn't know enough at the age of six to be saved. That's me personally. And at 14, I wanted to be saved, but I wanted to do it on my terms. And I thank God, when I was 22 years old, I saw the light. I saw salvation. I have lived in good conscience. And I know your conscience is important, folks, but here's the deal about your conscience. It totally depends on how you were raised. Think about this. Everyone is raised different. And what is right for some people is wrong for other people. So my thing here today is, Paul in his mind was saying, it's not that I am sinless, but I try to please God in everything I do. Now let me tell you something else about your conscience. Your conscience can fail you. Because a lot of times you are going by what someone else is saying. They say it's okay. They say you can do this. But folks, there's two things that you need to remember and figure out about your conscience. Number one, it needs to go along with the Word of God. What does the Word say? And if somebody is swaying you in your conscience and you're just going by your conscience, you could make a bad decision. A bad decision. So we have the Word of God. And the second thing we have to help us, I mentioned already, is the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God telling you, don't do it. You know better, but we do it anyway sometimes. So in his mind, in what he was trying to communicate was, I am not perfect. He didn't say, he just simply saying, you know, in general, most of the time, all right? Because I got news for you folks. There was only one man that never sinned, and that was Jesus Christ. Just one man, all right? And we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 2, and the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him in the mouth. You know, since I have gotten saved, I am so glad that has not happened to me. Matter of fact, Cameron Baptist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma, an evangelist came through, and he mentioned this here, and he said, the Bible says to turn the other cheek. And he was saying, if this happened to me, I would turn the other cheek, but if he hit me again, I would clean his plow. <laughs> now, folks, I can't agree with that logic. Maybe his conscience can let him get away with it. But can I go back to, and here's the deal. We have the deals, and I, I just like the word. Man, peace, belief, hope, faith. Folks, you're advertising when you wear these. Okay, somebody's going to ask you why you are wearing that. It gives you a gospel presentation. But what we say is, in these bracelets, was, what would Jesus do? Which is good. But here's what I want to say today. What did Jesus do? He's already done it. He's given us the example. He has shown us even in Scripture. I mean, they popped him in the mouth on his trial. And the Bible says he said nothing. Now, folks, I really feel like I can do this, but I wouldn't, <laughs> if I were you, I would watch who I pop. I'm not talking about me, but I would watch who I pop in the mouth because they may not think the same thing but Paul listen did nothing wrong he did nothing wrong and got smacked in the mouth the only thing worse and again I think I'd rather be hit than spit on okay 
you have to understand, you have to understand, Paul was not ready for this. Paul was surprised by this. Paul just, I mean, it was just like, bam, bam. It just happened. All right? Well, let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5 with me. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know who that is, folks? That's the world. The world says if somebody wrongs you, you can wrong them. The world says if somebody hits you, you can hit them. It says if somebody cheated you, you can cheat them. No, notice. But I tell you, notice it's in red. Jesus says, I tell you not to resist an evil person. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means, folks, it's going to happen. All right? It's going to happen. You cannot live in this world. You, you go to in business with somebody, and it all sounds good. Uh, and by the way, if somebody says, man, I can make a deal for you, I would check that out, folks. Because most deals that are unbelievable are not true. Okay? But it's saying don't avoid mean people. All right? We, we avoid mean people. All right? My, my deal is, folks, mean people need a friend. They need a Christian friend. All right? Mean people need to be saved. They really do. This is Jesus. Now, here it is. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Do you realize that he spoke this before it happened? Okay? He was teaching at the Sermon on the Mounds, and he knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And he could tell you, if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you want to be like Jesus, you don't react to it. And I know it goes against every bit of us. And some people say, well, I'm not backing down. I'm not a coward. I understand that. But you are a Christian. You are a follower. And why would Jesus say it? Why would it be in the Word if he did not want you to do that? Okay, let's keep reading. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. You want it? You can have it. All right, folks, I'm just telling you, not here. I had a shotgun. I love that shotgun. I brought, someone borrowed that shotgun that was a church member back in uh, Lawton. Never saw the gun again. Never asked him for it. Never said, I'm not speaking to you again. Folks, you have to do what Jesus did. And it says, 41, and go, and whoever compels you to go one mile with him, go two. What does that mean? It means if somebody asks you to do something, do more than they ask you to do. One of the things in youth ministry that I always remember is we spend a week at Falls Creek and you know we get in the cabin. I mean, you know, you take, I mean, a lot of kids to Falls Creek and Come Friday night, the cabin is trashed, okay? It's trashed. And what I learned and what I was taught and what the Bible says is you leave that cabin better off than you did when you came into that cabin. And what some people say is, well, it was dirty when we got there. That's their fault, all right? It is your reputation. It is your influence we are talking about. Folks, this is tough stuff. There's six sayings in this Scripture Six sayings here in Matthew chapter 5 that just goes beyond that second mile. God is asking more of you, okay? 42, give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow, do not turn it away. Here's what I figured out, and man, I've got this one down. People come to me and say, I want to borrow 20 bucks. I give it to them, and you know what I do? I kiss that 20 goodbye. Just not literally. <laughs> Folks, I will not lose a friendship over $20. Just won't do it. I will not have an attitude over $20. And I'll, I'll explain this in just a few minutes. Now go down to verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Man, that's not easy to do, folks. But Jesus said do it. Jesus did it. They cursed him. They called him Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. They said he had satanic motives in his healing. They cursed him. 
they cursed him. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I'm telling you, folks, this is what Jesus said we need to do. And Paul was caught off guard. There was a confrontation. It was a tough one. It was a huge test. Huge. So the second thing I want you to see is not only the confrontation, but the conflict. Then verse 3, then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. What did he do? He just reacted, folks. He just reacted. All right? And there was kind of an argument even with the commentaries uh, of, of was this a sin, was this wrong? Okay? In my opinion, it was wrong what he did. He reacted in the wrong way. What does whitewash wall mean? Well, Jesus said before, and he chided later on in Matthew, the scribes and the Pharisees. All right, you come with your robes on and you look all religious, but you steal from widows. All right? So you can look at that saying basically that you're all clean on the outside, but inside you're dirty. Your motives are dirty. But you know what I think Paul said? There's the other definition which I think he was really meaning. He said you hypocrite. You stinking hypocrite is what he was saying. For you to sit and judge me, that's why I say this, according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Paul was right in what he was saying. Okay, he was a Roman citizen, and this was not a, a real court. This was kind of a, a pre-court trial, and he was struck that was exactly why the commander stopped them from pulling him apart before, okay? And so Paul, in a sense, was mis... I mean, I mean he, he was misused. The guy shouldn't have done this. But still, to call names... Folks, names just... You know, a lot of times, in cursing, it's the language of the ignorant, it's the language of the angry. Somebody gets mad and curses you out. They're in anger, folks. And that's what, that's what I believe he's trying to say. The law says he shouldn't have been struck. But folks, it happens. Sometimes it's just life. Sometimes people are just mad. Sometimes people get up on the wrong side of bed. Sometimes people fall out of bed. And you're the brunt of everything they say that day. Verse 4, and those who stood by me said, do you not revile God's high priest? What is he saying? Folks, even with the office of high priest, because I got news for you, Ananias was not a good priest. You know what he did like to do? He stole pies from the temple. All right, He beat people for no reason at all. He was considered one of the worst high priests ever. One of the worst. But he was still the high priest. And folks, our Bible is very clear. We need to respect the office. The office. Someone in charge. We need to respect them. Yes, we have a right to an opinion. But just to bash people and bash people and bash people and be ugly about it and say nasty things about them is not good. Look at verse 5. Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was a high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. What did Paul immediately realize? He thought, man, I didn't know he was the high priest. So he had a reason, okay? There was a reason for it, but still you shouldn't talk that way to people. And that's what this is saying. Uh, when they came in again, again, they were in the common court. There were still a lot of people around. There were lots of witnesses. There were a lot of things going on. And, and I, some people say that he probably didn't have his high priest garb on. But you still shouldn't talk to people that way is what I believe. And do you know what the problem is, folks? The problem is we do not recognize spiritual warfare sometimes. I mean, Satan's out to get us. Satan does that at the worst time. Have you noticed how sometimes when you have a bad day, it just keeps getting worse? And you know what I've learned about bad days? Do not say this. What else could happen? 
You know what you're doing? You're telling Satan, right here. Okay, I'm already mad. And Satan goes, whoo I think I'll pop him in the chops. Bam, bam. And then we really lose it. Okay, and losing it is bad enough. But folks, really losing it's not good. Not good. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. And in some ways, Paul was apologizing. Now, I still say we don't apologize good or right, okay? We do it kind of like Fonzie. I was wrong. I, I was wrong. <laughs> we can't say I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Notice Paul quoted Scripture. Quoting Scripture is good. But words already said, folks, cannot be undone. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil hates you, folks. He's coming at you. He's got a plan. He's got demons, these legions of demons. Folks, I'm telling you, Satan can only be at one place at one time. But, but when you yell and tell Satan where your goat is, he's coming after you, folks. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Folks, it's not that person. That person is not the problem. God allows these to happen to strengthen you, to help you, to give you, you know, the fortitude, intestinal fortitude, to make you stronger. All right? And so many times we fail this test. And so it's not the person, that person that doesn't like you. Folks, you being ugly to them is not going to help the issue. We've already said in Matthew 5, we need to pray for those folks. Pray for them. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual uh, uh, hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Folks, Satan and his crew, one-third of the angels, were kicked out of heaven, according to Revelation. So there's a myriad of demons testing you, tempting you, trying to make you fall, trying to make you mad, trying to make you lose your temper. And we don't know where it's going to come from. Folks, sometimes it comes from the people closest to us, and I know that hurts. But we have to be like Jesus. We have to recognize, okay, this is spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. If you walked in my closet, in between my pants and my shirts, sitting there on, literally written out, is the armor of God. And every day when I get dressed, as I get dressed, I am quoting the armor of God. I am saying to the armor of God, look what it says here. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand with, uh, you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Folks, our days are evil. Evil is everywhere. You're going to run into it. You're going to feel it. You're going to sense it. All right? We have to be aware. We have to have our, our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears open. Open. Stand there for all having girded your waist with truth. God, I'm putting truth on today. I am not going to lie. I refuse to lie. I refuse to exaggerate. I refuse to do it. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, God, I want to do the right thing. The right thing today. The right thing. And having uh, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, God, please help me to be a peacemaker today. I need to be a peacemaker today. Help me not to stir up trouble. Above all, take the shield of faith. you got to have faith. you got to have faith. Have faith that God's going to get you through it. Have faith that it's going to come out okay. Have faith the truth is going to be known. And we fail test because we don't properly put on the armor. And if you've noticed the armor, it's always the front part that they're describing. Anybody that tucks tail and runs, you are not covered on the backside. We are to face it. We are to face it. And I've learned in life, folks, when there's something that you don't want to do, do it. Quit putting it off. Quit acting like it's not happening. Face it. 
your shield of faith, which is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Every day, he's got it in his hand. Folks, he's everywhere. He's in lots of situations. And we need the shield of faith. And take the helmet of salvation, folks. That's here. The battle is the mind. The battle is the mind. Jesus has already got your heart. The battle's in your mind. I've had people, I've had people tell me, I don't think you like me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? I like you. <laughs> You're okay. I, you know? I mean, and lots of times it's people I don't know very well. What is that? That preacher doesn't like me. That preacher didn't. That preacher didn't shake my hand. Well, we hadn't shook hands with anybody in a long time, but praise God we're doing it now. Folks, the battle is in, not against a person. It's in your heart and especially in your mind. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And here it is, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful. Watch for it, folks. Watchful to this end, with all perseverance. It's not easy. If everybody was doing it, I'm just telling you, everybody's not doing it. It doesn't happen to everybody. Everybody. Perseverance, strength, patience, and supplication for all the saints. So, we see the confrontation. Man, it caught him off guard. He had no idea this was coming. He reacted the conflict. And again, you choose which way to believe. Because again, there were writers that just said, well, he didn't know, he didn't know. Folks, I'm just telling you, you don't forget scribes and Pharisees that you had worked with before. It was just his flesh. And he started quoting Scripture. Started quoting Scripture. Now, back in our text, let's look at the conquest. All right, the conquest. Look at verse 6. But when Paul perceived that one part of the Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council. Now, folks, you've got to understand, Paul was smart. That dude was smart. Okay, he, he trained under one of the best. One of the best. All right, he was well-educated. He, he was a motivational speaker. I'm just telling you, he saw that this thing is going sideways. He thought, man, this is a kangaroo court and I'm in it. All right, he knew what they were up to. He knew their motive. So Paul, being part lawyer, I'll put it this way. If I lived in that day and I needed a lawyer, I'd pick Paul. I want Paul talking to him. That dude's smart. All right, look what he does. Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Because what did he do? He realized, man, i got to divide and conquer. Okay, we have the Sadducees, okay, and we have the Pharisees. And he tells the Pharisees, hey, I was one of you. You know I was one of you. Some of you know who I am. So what did he do? He thought, man, if I could get half of them on my side, I may not die today. All right, so he's smart. He is a smart man. Look at verse 7. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What did that do? It deflected what was going on. Okay, he got smacked. He got upset. He semi-apologized, I will say. And then he de de deflected that, all right? And it says... As the uh, assembly was divided. Verse 8, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirit. Okay, they didn't believe in any of those. But the Pharisees confessed both. And there arose a loud cry. The scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested. What did he do? He said, man, I'm one of y'all. All right, you're going to put up with this? All right, Paul, I'm telling you, the guy was smart. All right? He diffused the situation, and all at once they were arguing with one another. And it says, uh, we, uh, and the scribes of the Pharisees, uh, then he rose uh, outcry, verse 9, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, 
Let us not fight against it. All right, folks, I am telling you, I believe the Holy Spirit told Paul what to do. All right, because I've told you before that, you know, if we get it in a bind, Jesus had told his disciples, folks, don't worry about it. When you become come before magistrates and laws and all these people that are they're wicked and evil, don't worry about that. I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the words to say. All right, and this was what was going on. Verse 10, now when there arose a great dissension, now we're talking about, he said dissension before, now a great dissension. And it's almost part two of what happened before. They were tearing him apart when the commander uh, had came in and took him away. And the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him to the barracks. So what happened? Folks, Paul was protected again. Paul was protected again. Folks, I believe in the divine protection of God. Nothing's going to touch you. Nothing's going to touch you till God says so. And folks, we don't need to back down. All Paul was wanting, he was literally wanting to preach the gospel to these scribes and Pharisees that were religious. Religious. Folks, can I tell you this? Religion saves nobody. Religion saves nobody. Jesus Christ saves. They needed righteousness. They needed Jesus. In Paul, his motives were right, but he got caught off guard, and God spared him. God said, hey, I know, you know, I know it was, it was just a reaction, a chain reaction. But I'm telling you, it's not time. Why? Because God had already told him, you're going to witness to me before, I mean kings and people in high places. 2 Timothy 3, and I close with this. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. 2 Timothy 3.10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, <clears throat> speaking to Timothy, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, lo love, perseverance, persecutions, and afflictions. So what, what was Paul? Paul was just saying, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm the chiefest of sinners. There's times that I don't do the right thing. But don't forget my track record, all right? All right, I, I, I did all these things. I tried to show you these things. And folks, Paul loved people. He loved souls. And persecutions and afflictions which happened to be at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Miracles. All right, miracles happened. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Folks, as the world goes on, it's going to happen. You can't avoid it. Okay, now you can stay in your house and you can never come out. Okay, and if that's the way you choose to do it, God bless you. But I'm telling you, we, gotta, we have to get outside these four walls, folks. We have to be in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. We are the light of the world. People are looking at us. People are looking at how we react. To situations. Verse 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Folks, it's going to get worse. Persecution, I'm just warning you, it's going to get worse. They're going to take away, church-wise, they're going to take away our, our tax exempt system, you know, exempt status. And then what they're going to do, they're going to start trying to tell me and other preachers what they can say and what they can't say. And folks, if they tell me I can't pray in Jesus' name, too bad, all right? It's just too bad. I will always pray in Jesus' name. And if I preach the Word of God and they don't like it, that's too bad too. I just pray that y'all help me with a little bail money. When I get arrested, <laughs> just take an offering and get me out. We'll get some of James Dobson's lawyers. We'll get some of these big, big shot lawyers, and you'll get your preacher out of jail. But I will not, not back up from the Word of God. It's coming. It's getting worse. It's going to be serious, folks. It's going to be serious. 
14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing them, knowing whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise, and, and wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. See, Satan wants to shut us up. Satan wants to say we, we don't have the right, we don't have the freedoms to do that. And you know what I say? Fooey on that. All right, we have a right. We have freedom of speech just like everyone else. And we will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from this pulpit until the day I die or the doors are closed on this church. We will do it. And folks, my prayer is that you have that same thought in your mind. That evil out there, folks, it's needing to be saved. What do they need? I'm telling you, our world needs a good dose of Jesus Christ. He makes the right decision every time. Every time. And God has made us witnesses. You realize He set you apart. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So instead of, you know, just whining and, you know, tucking away and running, all right, represent Jesus everywhere you are. Everywhere you are. Tell people about Jesus. I'm telling you, that's what's wrong with this world. They don't know Jesus. And God has signed us up. God has put us in his army. And we need to tell everyone about Jesus Christ. He can and will change your life. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for Paul. Well, Lord, we know he's not perfect, and I wasn't picking on him today in any way. But God, I pray that you teach us to react the way you would react. God, I pray that we would say the right things. And God, I pray that we wouldn't lose our Christian witness, God. I pray that we could control our tongues and control our anger. And God, I pray that when we do lose it, when we go off on somebody, we will uh, repent, God. We will say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. God, I just pray, Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you, I'm telling you salvation is the best thing. It is the best thing. They can know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior today. If they'll just come, if they'll just surrender all, if they'll just give themselves to you and repent of their sins and invite you into their life, God, we can have that Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that you show us in the Word how to act, what to say, what not to do, what to do. And God, I pray this week we will make it a point to ask for a divine appointment. Ask God for somebody that you can talk to and encourage in the faith or lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God, that's why we're here. That's our mission. That's what we're about. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, whether it's salvation, rededication, baptism, church membership, if God has spoken to you, would you come?